Hi everyone, it's one o'clock by my watch, so <laughs> join back in. Uh, welcome back. Um, I know people are still going to be trickling in a little bit, so we'll just go through some of the uh, logistics while we're, we're waiting for everyone to join back in from from lunch. Uh, hopefully, everyone had a time to check out some of the poster sessions and the on-demand sessions that were out there. I think the poster sessions were really great earlier, so definitely check those out. Um, I'm Kevin Hassel with New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection's Coastal Management Program uh, for brevity. <laughs> um, and I serve on Marco's Management Board and Mako's Steering Committee. So I'll be set, uh, moderating their session today for uh, the sustainable ocean ecosystems. Um, and with that, I just wanted to make sure I welcome you all and thank you for coming to our fourth annual uh, Mid Atlantic Ocean Forum and to this session here. Um, I guess we can go through the text information next. Um, if you haven't already seen it, when we did this a few times already today, I'm sure everyone's used to all the Zoom platforms and everything else, but please um, mute yourself when you aren't speaking. Um, feel free to turn your webcams on and off throughout the, the meeting. Um, as we go through our panel's discussions this afternoon, please type your questions and comments into the chat. We'll be monitoring those to, to do that during the question and answer session. Um, Later on, you know, we'll have a question and answer session. If there is an opportunity for some verbal Q&A, we can raise your hand through the raise hand function in the reactions section. Um, I'll call on you if we, we have any there, but we also will go into breakout sessions later too, where that'll be useful. So um, with that, I think we'll just start up about our healthy ocean ecosystems. Um, so healthy ocean ecosystems deliver a range of services and benefits and support the social, economic, and environmental needs of this nation. So effective conservation strategies are needed to ensure our resources and ecosystem are sustainably managed and protected, while continuing to advance the sustainable use of our oceans and maximize benefits to our stakeholders, our communities, and a nation as a whole. So these strategies can be, only be accomplished through a collaborative and inclusive approach to conservation. So through this session, we intend to strengthen these conservation connections by focusing on things like connecting science, you know, by highlighting the research that looks at the effects of ocean use and conservation outcomes for species, habitat, and the ecosystem, and how these activities interact in our common ocean space. We also want to make sure that we're connecting people by highlighting all of our partnerships, our cross-organization activities, and community groups that are working to connect ocean use science and policies with conservation strategies. Um, and ultimately this leads us to connecting conservation products with outcomes. So when it comes down to it, today Mako is talking about forming a new ocean conservation work group. Uh, we wanna make sure we're able to connect conservation practitioners with its science, data and expertise needed to ensure our sustainable ocean ecosystem is able to support a sustainable ocean economy. So, Today, we've got an amazing panel lined up to highlight some of these connections across a variety of scales and issues. Uh, I'm excited because I think our panelists have a great deal of information across the spectrum of interconnected issues for us to all to think about. Um, you know, like I said earlier, we'll have an opportunity for a question and answer session after their talks. And then following the speakers later, uh, we'll move into a breakout session where we can have a dialogue in small groups on advancing conservation at the regional scale and what MAKO can do through a new inclusive work group. Um, with, uh, so without further ado, um, we'll start the show here. And uh, you know, please remember to enter your questions into the chat section there so we can ask those up. So uh, first up is Marta Ribera from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Marta is a spatial ecologist with the Nature Conservancy, where she focuses on interdisciplinary ecosystem studies and integrating physical, ecological, and socioeconomic data sources. Um, Marta's talk will be about using climate data, wildlife data, and fish projections to make economic and management decisions. It's the Future Blue Project. Uh, yeah, Marta? Hi, everybody. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully, it all works. Um, so hopefully you see my screen by now. If not, just let me know. Um, okay, hi everybody. Thank you for having me as part of this forum. Um, so as uh, Kevin mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that we started this year. Um, it's a collaboration with a lot of different <laughs> institutions, uh, but also uh, it's a connection to uh, something that happened in this forum last year. Um, so let's see if I can get my mouse here. There you go. Um, so about Two years ago, um, 
we started this project that we, we tried to like leverage a lot of information available um, in the region um, to kind of help through the review process of environmental impact statements uh, related to offshore wind. And um, we knew that we live in, the, we all know that we live in a very data rich region compared to other areas in the country. And we wanted to make sure that that information was available and really accessible to everybody. And that people had a reference uh, point when looking at all these information. So through that, um, we created what we call the marine mapping tool, um, which is still available, please check it out. And we're just leveraging with all this marine life and habitat data that's been reviewed and processed for many years through the portals. And um, it kind of put everything in, con in context for like the site you cared about. So um, as part of this marine mapping tool, um, we kind of showed um, it's like past historical data for fish. Um, so part of the trawl survey, we showed this like historical data, for like what the fish in the biomass of these species have been doing for the last few decades. And um, when, when we presented this, um, we royally, because I was um, having a baby at that point, but um, we presented this uh, research and this pro project at um, last year's forum. Um, one of the questions was, well, can we do a similar approach for instead of looking at the past, looking at the future. And it got us thinking, obviously this is not a trivial um, question because as you all know, we're already being quite impacted by um, a changing climate across our region. And that's impacting not just the temperature of our waters, but also the species. And it's an impact that we don't see across the board the same way. So different areas see different impacts on, on that climate change. And, you have some areas you see new opportunities based on new species coming in, and some areas you see uh, really very, uh, very important economical um, economic uh, impacts uh, based on the species that are not decreasing their abundance quite um, quite fast. Um, so once we started these, um, we uh, collaborated with. Um, the group on uh, Melin Pinsky, uh, Dr. Melin Pinsky at Rutgers University. We kind of started thinking of like what, um, how do we right now make decisions based on this future data? And the answer is not really. <laughs> we don't use future data in most of the cases to make decisions. And one of the problems is that our data doesn't support that. Uh, we don't have information that actually looks into the future. We uh, All the information that you see on the portals and everywhere is that kind of be collected a few years ago um, because it obviously takes time to process. And so you really, it gives you a snapshot of what that system looked like in the past, but it doesn't really, because the system changes so much, it doesn't really provide a lot of the future vision. So we're always, without decision-making, we're always reacting to things that are happening right now. We cannot plan ahead, uh, which we see as a problem. Also, when we have some future projections, the scale of the data, it really doesn't match the scale of decision-making. So right now the projections we're using is this like global uh, projections or country uh, statewide. And what we should be looking is things at a local regional scale to really inform how different projects and different uh, planning, uh, it's really impacted by how the species and habitat are changing over time. And also these data are right now just accessible to very few. Um, they're just mainly if you're a scientist, um, you've seen a lot of papers and seen some of the data on some of, web, of the websites, but a lot of people do not have access to the information. So when you're making a decision on what, what you want to do and how you plan uh, your business, your projects, your conservation actions across um, many years, you cannot think in the future because you don't have that information to really support that decision making. Um, so our question is like, how do we make better decisions in the ocean? And it's a simple question with a lot of <laughs> just the different ramifications, but uh, really it's how do we make decisions that are future looking. Um, so as I was mentioning, we put together this group of people um, that's uh, uh, led by uh, Dr. Melin Pinsky at uh, Rutgers University, but it also includes other organizations like UConn, the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, UMass, and ROSA, and many other people. And uh, it's part of uh, NSF-funded uh, Conversions Acceler Accelerator, which is what it tries to do is try to find solutions to problems for the blue economy, which obviously this is one of them, how to use um, future data for decision-making. 
So as part of this project, first, obviously, we're trying to tackle the data problem. So we're trying, we're developing, currently developing uh, downscale projections that are near term and focus on local resources. So you see on the left, some of our first runs um, uh, on the model, and you can see like how it really can, um, like the technology has really evolved to really be able to uh, answer some of the questions we can have at the regional scale. And it's not just a temperature, which is some one showing here on the left, but we can also have projections on salinity, both at the bottom and the surface, stratification, pH, saturation state, many other variables uh, out of this model. We're also predicting um, wind uh, and also the implications on uh, how much um, wind and how much of the economic impact will be uh, based on that wind output. And all this information is then uh, translated to and inputted uh, to different models on species, not just here you see invertebrates and uh, fish, but also uh, we're planning on models on marine mammals and models on birds as part of a collaboration with the uh, Duke team um, and uh, the NCOS team at NOAA. And this is tackling the data, but then we're like, okay, we wanna make sure that the metrics and the information we put out there answers the questions that people have. And that's putting kind of information in context, the same way that we talked about it last year about the marine mapping tool, kind of like not just saying what's the level of biomass you have on a location, but also within a region that doesn't mean it's a lot, a little, how, what's the implication for that species. I also kind of context so over time, what's, um, is that species aggregating in that location over time and it's expected change um, in the future. And also we're trying to connect it as much as we can within a community. So will my community have increased fishing opportunities in the future? Um, so it's not just about the data about the fish, but how it actually is impacting all, all across the region. And that means connecting it to a data set that we already use, which is called the Communities at Sea, which was developed at Rutgers. And that uh, connects the offshore resources to the port and community information inshore. Um, to actually connect those two, uh, to make sure that um, what we're designing at offshore, it actually uh, gets translated to all the impacts uh, that translate to the communities in the ports. So we talked a little bit about the data, but we actually want to tackle a little more than that. Um, so we want to make sure that all this information is freely accessible to everybody. So that means working with current platforms that people already go for information. And obviously one of them and very important that one is the Marco of data portal. So we're really working with the regional data portals to make sure that um, the information is there accessible to everybody and that people can query and look at the information and make decisions based on that. But kind of we're not living at a, just that yet, we have one more step. and. We know like from our experience, I've been working with the data portals for many, many years. And our experience is that data portals are really useful for our group of people, but there's still a group of people in the blue economy that do not access the portals. Um, in part because they don't see it connected to the site they care about. So we're developing, we're developing a tool that actually makes that connection, that makes it all about that site and that project area that you're interested in and connects the different pieces of information. So it's not just about one, one fish and I'm seeing a layer. Uh, it kind of tells you um, in that side, uh, what are the trends, what would you expect in the future? Is that species gonna increase or decrease and how that relates to all the other characteristics of the system? And finally, how that connects again to the ports. So you're just seeing a little bit more the full picture of what that site is about. So to end, I'm gonna put my <laughs> little cheesy um, slide at the end, but just kind of to say that we're doing this right now in part because obviously we're already seeing the impacts of climate change in our region, but also technology and the tools are ready and available for everybody to use. So it's kind of the right time to really tackle, really tackle this and this get all our brains together to make sure that when we're planning, we're not planning based on information in the past, which is really useful, but we're also adding uh, what we think the future is gonna look like. So we're just um, planning ahead a little better. So with that, I'm just gonna leave it like that. So I don't know if you're, we're taking questions right now or later, but just um, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Yeah, we'll, we'll stick around after everyone's talked to have some okay, Q&A questions. Um, yeah, that was really great. I think it, uh, you know, 
we all would agree here that <laughs> making sure people have access to, to data, whether it's past or future, is, is key for helping people make decisions. Uh, so next up, we're going to have Dr. Daphne Monroe, Rutgers University. Uh, Dr. Monroe is an associate professor at Rutgers University, Haskins Shellfish Research Laboratory in Port Norris, New Jersey. So her research focuses on the complex interactions of economically and ecologically important coastal or river species. Uh, Daphne is going to talk to us about aquaculture and conservation in the Atlantic. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, talk today, and uh, I am a shellfish ecologist, so um, I apologize. My, my shellfish leaning is going to come through in what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I've kind of reframed the title of my talk here to, to reflect that bias a little bit. I'm going to talk about aquaculture as a, conserva as a, a tool for conservation in a region. And this isn't a new idea. This is something that others have talked about in the literature, a couple of important papers shown here um, about conservation aquaculture and how, um, you know, uh, various aquaculture systems can be used as a tool for conservation and, and coastal protection and enhancement. And I'm going to walk through a few examples um, a lot of the ways that we think about um, aquaculture as a conservation tool come through um, their function in serving ecosystem services uh, in the coastal uh, in, in the coastal system. And I'm going to touch on three specific uh, topics that I've actually been working on in my lab. These might be familiar to the group, but um, I'll, I'll go through those fairly quickly, and I can talk in more detail in the. Um, in the session later. Um, and then I'll, I'll touch on offshore aquaculture, but I'll caveat that to say that I'm not um, as well versed as I maybe could be in that. Um, and then I'll end on a little bit of an idea about um, considerations around wildlife and, and sensitive species. But the first ecosystem service I'll talk about is uh, this idea that shellfish on farms can provide filtration and water quality benefits. And there's been a lot of interest and energy around this. The, the two um, figures here show an in, the increase over time in articles in the peer-reviewed literature and citations around TMDL management, best management practices, and shellfish aquaculture and nutrients in the coastal system. So um, a couple of years ago, we were funded by um, the NRAC, the Northeast Regional Aquaculture Center, to go out and, and do some experiments in the field. A lot of what we know about um, ecosystem services by shellfish in particular filtration come from um, experiments in the lab under very controlled conditions. And we know that um, oyster filtration in particular can be is highly variable. Um, and changes with water quality, with temperature, with time of year. And so um, my graduate student, Janine Barr, from here, went to these shellfish farms in the region. I'm just showing one of the farms here, um, but went to shellfish farms and did these experiments with natural water on the farm with farmed oysters. And what she found was that, of course, the, the amount uh, of water filtered changes through the, the course of the year. This is a seasonal response, more largely to temperature, um, but also has very, um, varies with the water quality. And um, the numbers I'm showing you here, you know, a lot of, a lot of people use the number 50 gallons a day um, filtered by an adult oyster. Well, we actually found in the peak season here in natural conditions, and if you take into consideration, oysters aren't always filtering at the same time. Um, we got a maximum of about 13 gallons per oyster per day. Um, so, you know, this is, I think there's lots of opportunity to improve and refine how we understand this particular ecosystem service. But um, we also know that these farms uh, in the coastal system provide habitat. And again, this isn't uh, a new idea. This is something that we, we know pretty well. And I'm, I'm showing a, a paper here, a review paper that was uh, led by Seth um, Thurkoff recently. Um, describing the habitat value of various aquaculture systems. Um, and there's all kinds of ways that this, this can, that can work. Um, and one of the things we've been doing is collaboratively with the um, NOAA Milford Lab, um, we've been going out and looking at um, using underwater cameras to look at just how, what kinds of uh, habitat is being provided, what species are using these. And I show you this website to encourage you to check out um, the NOAA's multimedia page. They've got some really great video resources there. Um, so we went out and put some cameras at a farm in, uh, in Barnegat Bay, in southern Barnegat Bay, um, in 2018 and 19, and we looked at what fish species were using floating oyster bags and what species were using off-bottom cages, 
And we compared that all to a, a control that was the edge of the marsh, so a 3D natural habitat in that same area. And we've published this work. Um, I'm showing the publication there, but I'm happy to send that along. And what's cool with the publication is we actually put a video supplement in there. So if you want to take a look at what we were seeing and what um, critters were using the farm, um, there's uh, the resources there. Um, so just real quickly, I won't go into the details of what, what we saw, but the the take home message on a, on a conservation and management side of things in all of our videos that we looked at, I'm showing the list of all the species we saw here. Um, the ones that are highlighted in yellow show you um, the, these are all commercially um, managed. These are all commercial um, fishery species. And in a lot of cases, what we were seeing were juveniles um, using juveniles of these commercially important species using these habitats. So um, there's some uh, relevance here to, to commercial species or species that we're interested in. Um, another ecosystem service uh, is this idea of shoreline protection by farms. Um, and I'm showing you the farm here. This picture is a farm that we did this uh, little bit of a pilot scale work on. So it was funded by the US Coastal Research Program, USCRP, um, and it was uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Diane Foster at the University of New Hampshire and her graduate student, Spencer. Um, and so the idea with this is, you know, there's a lot of um, particularly conservation conversations around um, oyster reefs or restoring oyster reefs for shoreline protection purposes. And um, I'm showing you a Google Earth image here. Thank you so much, Google, for uh, providing these great images of the world. Um, this is the farm we worked at and what you're seeing, you know, from above the, you're seeing onshore waves. This is a very common thing that happens in the afternoons at this site. Um, and I'm, the yellow arrows show you these um, slick areas at the time in 2018. This is exactly where the farm gear was out in the system. And so at this time, under these conditions, there was this really nice kind of wave dampening um, thing happening at the farm. And so um, Diane and I got talking about this and um, decided to uh, put together a project where her group developed these kind of low cost wave pressure sensors that we then, that's what you're looking at here is these sensors. And we put those out um, around the farm, um, offshore of the farm gear and within the, the footprint of the farm gear and then inshore of the farm gear. And sure enough, what we see is that under certain tidal conditions, there's a reduction in wave pressure. Um, inshore of and within the footprint of the the oyster gear and so there's this this idea then that you know with more data we might be able to um, do a better job of understanding just how these oyster farms function in terms of shoreline protection and resiliency um, and we could possibly even bring that into permitting considerations or um, spatial planning considerations um, I'll jump now to, to offshore aquaculture. There's lots of opportunity in the offshore aquaculture sector. Um, you know, NOAA is very interested in, in um, developing uh, aquaculture in federal waters. And um, to, we've got a project in my lab that's just spinning up right now that was jointly funded by the NOAA um, National Sea Grant Office and the Ocean Acidification Program. Um, um, where if I have my we're going to be um, planting some, some large cages out in the coastal ocean um, in federal waters to see if that improves the performance of, of that species in, in, uh, as, a, as a grow out method. Um, and so we'll be happy to share results when we have them from that. And we're partnering with uh, the, the commercial fishery um, to go and do that work. Um, oh, I think I lost a slide. Um, but largely, you know, what's going on in, in offshore aquaculture uh, sits in the in the realm of, of mussels right now, fin fish um, and kelp. And I won't go into detail on that because that's a, a little bit outside of, uh, of my my world, aside from the mussel part. Um, and then I'll, I'm going to I'm going to wrap up um, on this uh, idea of, you know, a lot of what I've talked about are kind of these ecosystem services and and really positive conservation aspects of, of aquaculture. Um, but we can't forget that these are human systems that are in in the coastal environment and we need to be aware of and and careful around. Um, interactions with wildlife in general, but in particular endangered species interactions. And here in New Jersey, um, one of the things that, that came um, up as an issue uh, in 2015 when the red knot, and that's the, the bird pictured on the left, um, was listed as threatened, um, 
there was concerns about our intertidal aquaculture systems that are located in the Delaware Bay intertidally, and that's what the picture on the right shows you. Um, in the background there are the, the rack and bag oyster gear. And these farms are located in a, in a place where horseshoe crabs come inshore to spawn. It's not the only place they come to spawn, but it's a, it's a pretty high aggregation spawning area. And the birds, um, the red knot in particular, when it comes through to migrate to the Arctic, um, it feeds on the horseshoe crab eggs. And so there was a lot of concern from a conservation standpoint about um, whether the oyster farms were having an impact on either the horseshoe crabs and, and by, by that um, the horseshoe crab eggs that then the birds use as food. And we've got some, uh, a couple of projects funded through New Jersey Sea Grant to look at this issue. And we did a number of experiments around this, but one of the, you know, the kind of the summary uh, answer is the, the picture that I'm showing on the right. And you can see this little male horseshoe crab, if you can, if you can see um, and follow his tracks all the way back, he very clearly um, walked at low tide through that farm to get up towards uh, his spawning habitat. So we, we found in all of our studies that there was really no cause for concern, but it is important to keep these, uh, you know, kind of uh, wildlife interactions as a conservation issue in mind when we talk about aquaculture. Um, and so I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, and again, I'm happy to provide more detail about any of that um, in the session later. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Daphne. I, uh, I think that really highlights that, you know, when we're thinking about um, conservation, is there's a whole spectrum of, of issues that we can really think about and then think of how we are doing conservation. So it's really helpful. Uh, so next up, we have Carl Vilkova from our own Mid-Atlantic Ocean data portal. Um, so Carl is Monmouth University's Urban Coast Institute's Communications Director, and he's a Communications Lead and Project Manager for the Mid-Atlantic Ocean data portal. Take it away, Carl. Thanks, Kevin. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? Yeah, looks great. Again, uh, Carl Vilkova. I am the Communications Director at Monmouth University's Urban Coast Institute located uh, about a mile away from the beach on the Jersey Shore. And I serve as the portal project manager for, or the, for the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal. And uh, over the next few minutes, I'd like to run through some of the new and upcoming ecological data on the portal that can support ocean management decisions and of course, um, sustainable ocean ecosystems. So uh, I presume probably a good portion of our uh, audience here is at least familiar with the portal, but for those who aren't, it is a free and publicly accessible resource at portal.midatlanticocean.org. And we have now somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 6,000 map layers, which can be shown one at a time or in any combination with each other, organized under 13 categories or themes. Um, you can see them to the right, fishing, marine life, maritime data, recreation, security, and so on. Um, we are predominantly focused on the mid-Atlantic states, which we define as being from New York down through uh, Virginia and uh, from the shoreline on out. But there are many exceptions to both of those rules where we have data that um, are well beyond in geographic um, scope and um, come into some of the key estuaries and rivers in our region. Um, the portal also, I should point out, provides long range regional information, not real time data like um, Maracuse Oceans Map or other tools, and includes maps that show change over time for ocean activities and ecological resources. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, great tools for users to share their maps and collaborate together in groups around projects and instructional and educational resources like um, a blog where we have announcements and instructional information anytime there's um, a new significant data set or tool addition. We have our educational ocean stories platform, which is kind of like a uh, digital magazine meets story map, a calendar of events, and we host periodic webinars. The portal tech team currently consists of Monmouth, where I sit, Rutgers University, Duke, uh, New York State, our developer EcoTrust out of Portland, Oregon, and we work under the guidance of Marco and Mako. So any discussion of ecological data on the portal, I think, must start with the Marine Life Data and Analysis Team products, or MDAT, 
Um, the MDAT data has been maintained by Duke University with um, Emily Shumchenia, who I saw in the audience a little bit ago, um, who will be speaking tomorrow and has managed a number of marine life work groups on behalf of MROC and Marco. I think many of you on this webinar have participated in those work groups and the peer review process for this data. And uh, this data can be found on the portal in two ways. Number one, our marine life theme. Uh, we have a lot of maps showing, summarizing groups of marine birds, fish, and marine mammals. Or you can go to our marine life library to look at um, maps that focus on specific species. The group maps were created in some cases to provide a snapshot of distributions for multiple species that belong to biological groups. For example, uh, baleen whale maps that include all of our data for humpbacks, right whales, and others. And in other cases, group maps were created to address management needs, such as cetaceans with sound sensitivity, uh, birds with high collision sensitivity, or various protected species. I find that the group maps are a nice way to get that high level um, initial sense of um, their full range. And then you can kind of drill down and explore individual species by season or by month, depending on what you're looking for, um, for a lot more detail. And um, I can include in the chat in a little bit uh, a, a link for the MDAT website, which has a full report on all of these map products and downloadable GIS files for them. Although the first wave of MDAT data came onto the portal around 2016, we have done a lot of work with our partners since then to maintain it, to keep it up to date, to um, add key products as time's gone on. Uh, the most recent release a couple of weeks ago was um, uh, marine mammal updates, which included um, North Atlantic right whale maps that were updated based on recent data and an updated model from Duke. Um, in a nutshell, we uh, doubled the resolution of those North Atlantic right whale maps and they're, they're much improved. There are cetacean group maps that include all of the right whales. They, they were up, updated with um, all of that data that made um, up those right whale maps. And we upgraded the sound sensitivity group maps for marine mammals. And if you look at our blog at uh, midatlanticocean.org or you know the, the portal site, the news blog, you can find an announcement toward the top that summarizes all of that. Um, coming soon, we have, um, well, our, our current fish data captures and is summarized, uh, or summarizes a, a decade of data from 2010 through 19. And we're gonna start going back in time and adding um, maps that show from the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and right up through um, the current day, basically. Um, we will also include um, some maps that account for uh, distribution of fish that are possibly um, uh, sensitive to EMF, which could be key for um, examining submarine cable project for cables that are bringing the um, high voltage electricity from the uh, turbines to land. Um, I should mention that these data were developed in consultation with marine life work groups over the last decade. Um, and also there, there was a recent release by NOAA Fisheries of a related tool called BizMap, which some of you may know of, um, and that shows fish distributions also. Um, if you wonder how they compare or relate, we use the same underlying data from NOAA Fisheries Trawls and Rutgers Ocean Adapts project. Um, the DISMAP developers participated in the work groups over the last uh, year or so. Um, I think the portal is a great place to see the maps of the fish distributions and shifts in the context of the thousands of other mid-Atlantic specific maps we have for anything from vessel traffic patterns, wind projects, fishing activity and so on. And then maybe you can go to DISMAP for um, additional species details and looks at um, fish distributions in, in other places around um, the US. Um, coming very soon, I'm, I'm excited about this. We're gonna add a collection of maps that um, are based on um, marine mammal strandings data collected by the various stranding centers from Maine through Virginia. And you're gonna be able to view these by a few ways. So by season, so for example, 
<clears throat> if you want to see all of the strandings um, points for just uh, winter from those 20 years, you can do that. If you prefer to see um, a few of the key um, species or species groups that we pulled out, you can do that. So for example, if you want to just see where North Atlantic right whales uh, were reported strandings uh, were, were reported over the, those two decades, you can see that. And we also have county summaries, which give a sense of um, where there might be kind of hot spots of um, reporting activity over the years. Coming very soon, as in maybe even the next couple of days, we have been working over the winter with the whale and dolphin watch uh, operators from the Mid-Atlantic to create some maps that show uh, the key areas that they rely on, the, the dominant and um, you know secondary uh, areas that uh, they conduct their watches on. And um, that will have a lot of implications and hopefully use for uh, ocean management. Our seafloor habitat theme we added about a year ago because we continued to um, grow the amount of data that we have on that topic um, pretty quickly. So uh, in that theme, you can find high definition bathymetry showing the ocean floor and the canyons. You can find um, information about sediment types, um, the, uh, how currents affect the sediments on the bottom, uh, models of ocean, uh, of shoals in the ocean. Um, you can also, uh, as you see on this map, which shows seabed habitat uh, disturbance from bottom trawling by month from the year 2017. We have uh, about 350 maps in the theme that model the effects of fishing gear on the seafloor. And they all come from a Northeast Fishery Management Council project. So it was their data um, reviewed by their habitat committee and we are thankful to have it on the portal. I'll also just mention the oceanography theme, which um, has a lot of relevant data, including some long-term maps summarizing the real-time information that you can find on the Maracuse Oceans map. So for example, um, uh, surface temperatures, uh, this one here shows um, sea bottom temperatures by month, and it has a, a monthly slider. That's a tool that we have that allows you to manually toggle through the months or click a button to automatically animate it, um, currents data, net primary productivity, and some others that could be of use. And I think I'll end there. It's just so hard to, in 10 minutes, really delve into all the things that are on the portal, but uh, I welcome any questions. And if anyone out there is ever interested in us doing a training or a demo for you and uh, your colleagues, uh, send me an email. Um, I'm, I have Nick Napoli's address on there too. He manages not only the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal, but the Northeast and uh, either of us are contacts for that. So thank you very much. And I yield the floor to Chris, I believe is next. Yeah, thanks Carl. Um, you know, it's good to see all the data that gets updated in there. It's uh, always useful to, to work with that. And it's a great collaboration tool. So thanks for all that. Uh, so next up, uh, Dr. Chris Hake, he's a postdoctoral research scientist. Um, Dr. Hake is a, works with a cooperative agreement between NOAA Fisheries and Monmouth University on the Northeast Regional Marine Fish Habitat Assessment. Um, Chris is gonna talk to us today about an application of com community level model for marine fish habitat. Take it away, Chris. I think you're all still on mute. Muting. Okay, is that better? Yep, I can hear you. All right, next, let's try and share my screen. All right, perfect. Groovy. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Chris, I'm a postdoc uh, working at UCI, uh, the Urban Coast Institute uh, in a cooperative position with NOAA and, um, and also with the fishery, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Man Management Council. Um, and I'm going to talk about some fisheries modeling, habitat modeling specifically. Um, 
as everyone's probably quite aware, um, there's a lot of interest in understanding where fish are and when and how that's going to change as the environment continues to change. Um, so, but just for a quick intro, I just want to talk about what is fish habitat? Um, it's habitat that's necessary for the growth, survival, and reproduction of fish. Um, it's ultimately a function of several different things. It has to do with the innate sort of physiological limitations of an animal, what kind of temperatures it can withstand and what kind of salinity regimes it can withstand, what, how much water movement it can deal with. Um, habitat's also defined by ecological requirements. So does it offer refuge from predators or resources like food? Um, it's also defined by multiple life stages. So fish um, change a lot from birth to death and they um, have go through various different life stages that utilize different habitats and have different habitat requirements. So it complicates things a bit more. And complicating all that is that the environmental factors that fish respond to are often very dynamic. Uh, fish don't build houses on the seafloor and stay there. They, at least not most of them, they move around, they track environmental conditions. And, um, and so modeling them is not an easy task. Um, so one way you can think about habitat use among fish is, is a sort of a, results through a number of concurrent processes that, um, that range from kind of broad scale to finer scale processes. On the broader, broader end of things, you have this uh, the idea of environmental, environmental filtering, that animals um, can only inhabit places, locations where the conditions, the ambient conditions are, again, compatible with their own limitations and physiological tolerances. Um, so again, that goes back to a lot of abiotic variables like salinity and temperature and wave energy, stuff like that. Um, but on finer, as you move into finer scales, you also have um, interactions between animals. Um, and so what we call biotic interactions where species push and pull each other around in space and in different ways. And that can also influence the way the distributions that we see, um, patterns of habitat use that we see um, among fish. So, sorry, I'm trying to read my screen, but there's something on there. <laughs> um, how can biotic interactions affect habitat use? Just to go over a few examples of sort of how animals can influence one another and, and push and pull each other in space. Um, kind of one of the most classical fundamental ideas is this idea of competition that species that have similar niches can, can exclude each other from spaces. Um, there's migratory coupling where um, if predators, their distributions can actually be driven by the distributions of their prey. For example, right whales migrate to go find calanoid copepods. Um, there are also non-consumptive predator prey effects um, where prey, for example, are, are modify their behavior purely as a result of the fear of being eaten. So that can mean they don't go to a certain area because there are high density of predators. Um, and finally, you can have positive social interactions where maybe information exchange um, between potential competitors, species that, that also maybe share similar food or, or predators um, will actually group together and share space so that they can kind of team up against a common enemy. So all these things um, have the potential to scale up to, uh, to quite broad scales. It's increasingly recognized that, that these things that we tend to think of happening at, at the individual level um, can be perceived on much broader scales. So just a quick touch on how we assess habitat use. It's kind of tricky um, if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Um, we can't just drain the ocean and look and see where fish are. We we have to um, we have to survey it, and um, so basically we base um, habitat on uh, on observed densities, places where we see a lot of fish regularly. We presume that they're happy there, and there's a reason they're there. Um, but the way we sample fish is, for example, that we'll talk about the NIMS bottom trawl survey, where we go out and drag a net in the water and 
see what's in there. Um, and it's a little more complicated than that, but that's essentially what it is. And we're trying to sample a vast area, um, say the Northeast Shelf at 260,000 square kilometers roughly, um, using gear that samples less than a square kilometer per tow. And, and each year out of, even despite 700 toes, we're sampling less than a 10th of a percent of, of the shelf. So we have this very sparse data um, at discrete points in space time. Um, how do we use that to, to make inferences about habitat beyond saying there were fish in the places where we sampled? Um, and so that's where this idea of species distribution models comes in. It's, it kind of allows us to try and understand a little better why fish are where they are, and then extend that to make predictions about where they might be. Um, essentially, they estimate the niche of an animal by its habitat niche by relating the observed densities that we see in surveys to the environmental predictors, the environmental conditions at, at those survey locations. So for example, we have our, our observed densities on the left. We have our predictor variables like salinity and temperature. And then we, based on the relationships between how many fish we find at a given point and say the temperature and salinity at a point, we sort of infer these curves um, or the sort of the niche space that this is, and we say this is the, the condition that this animal prefers. Um, but in doing that, we also, we, we can look at our fitted model and rarely, if ever, are, is our predicted, our fitted model 100% in agreement with our, our, um, our observations. Um, we have these things called residuals and they're kind of the leftovers, the difference uh, between what we predicted and what we actually saw. Um, and so in single species models, those residuals we just say goodbye to, we say their error, they result from, they could be the result of a whole, all kinds of things from happening to just ineffective gear to um, just sampling a few hundred yards too far from where we might have caught thousands of fish, but they can also result from other things like the other ecological processes that form communities. Because uh, remember, we're only here controlling for environmental factors. So, in the single species context, those residuals are chalked up to error and that's it. But when we look at more species, we look at multiple species at once, um, those residual patterns can be used to, to draw inferences. Um, they, they carry information. When you see pairs of species that show very similar patterns of residuals, for example, um, if you places where if you catch a lot of fish in one, if those residuals are high in one location or for a single toe, and, and they are also high for the other species, and that continues across the entire um, set of toes, um, that's hinting that there's something more going on there. Um, and likewise, if there, there are two very different, if their residuals are almost completely the reverse of one another, negatively correlated, um, it might indicate that the, those species are, are excluding each other or avoiding each other. It also might indicate that there's an, a predictor variable that you missed, um, something that they're both responding to differently, but it hasn't been included in the model. But so, and you can take a, when in modeling these species together, you can model the covariance between these species and use that to improve your predictions and also to kind of draw some ecological inferences. So joint models, JSDMs as we call them, do exactly that. They model both species environment relationships, the environmental filtering component and the, the covariation and the residuals between species, um, which these things that might evidence species interactions or, or responses to missing predictors. They model them together at one time. Um, and out of that, you can get better predictions for a number of reasons, um, not just that you're taking into account these other potential processes, but also that you can pool information across species when you're, you're estimating things now. If you're trying to estimate a, a latent underlying variable, you're now, instead of just trying to, to infer it from a data for a single species, you've got it for you know, 60 or 90 species. Um, we call it, uh, another term is borrowing strength. Um, so in doing these kind of things, um, 
JSDMs have proven to be a, a valuable tool for, for predicting uh, future distributions. Um, the only problem with them is that they have historically, they're computationally very complex and expensive. Um, and especially for large data sets where you have thousands and tens of thousands of observations, they're largely infeasible. Um, especially in, in, in the case when it's spatio-temporal data where you're also trying to deal with um, correlations in space and time, which make things even more computationally burdensome. So I had the good fortune to work with some really smart statistics, statisticians and over the past couple of years have been developing an alternative approach for fitting joint models that uses the machinery similar to what general added, added, generalized additive models or GAMs use, um, which are essentially basis functions, building blocks. Um, if you look at this diagram on the left, you can see all these little curves and, and then this big red curve. And instead of trying to describe that curve in terms of points and lines, you describe that curve in terms of all those little curves and their relative weights. Um, and so you can take that sort of, that's happening in one dimension. You can take that and expand it to a multi-dimensional space, 2D space, and you can use that, um, that sort of machinery, that approach to quite flexibly and, and much more efficiently model covariation between species in time and space. So we've been working on this, this method for almost two years now. Uh, we finally have a manuscript coming out and um, it's gonna be released on GitHub soon. Um, it's, we did some simulation studies. It's working better or as well as, as, as most other methods and uh, it's drastically faster. So quickly, just application wise, we're, uh, we're applying this now as part of the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment to the NIMPS bottom trawl survey um, using a training set of 15 years, a testing set of five years, and fitting it to abundance data for 91 species right now um, with a pretty large set of 14 predictors. And uh, long story short, it's predicting considerably better than, than GAMs or even spatio-temporal GAMs. Uh, the biggest differences tend to be in some of the the lower, weaker performing species, it tends to uh, really bring them up. And so um, what do we get out of this in terms of products? We get all the same things we get out of any regular single species model. Um, we get estimates of species niches that we can use to make projections. We can identify the relative uh, importance of different environmental predictor variables for each species. And we get this residual correlation, correlation matrix that lets us draw some inferences about, um, hopefully about underlying ecological dynamics and what's happening um, between species and not just the environment. Um, so in our future steps are to take this a little further we, to visualize the results, um, get them on portals where we can share them with stakeholders. Um, uh, we hope to take the same model and use it to generate projections based on climate models. So we can look at some longer term um, pro uh, projections of, of where, what fish, where our fish communities will move and what they're gonna look like. Um, and that's about it for the time. I wanna say thanks to the rest of my NRA team, the NERA team, NRA, sorry, NERA team. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and also Francis Gui, um statistician galore. Um, that's it. Any questions? Great. Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, I think that just shows the amazing amount of complexity that's happening in our, our environment and all the ideas that things that we need to think about as we, we move forward with this stuff. So thanks so much. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Latisse Lafier. Um, Dr. LaFear is a senior advisor at NOAA's Office of the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, where she serves on a number of interagency work groups focused on executing President Biden's executive, executive orders. Uh, Dr. LaFear is going to be talking about America the Beautiful, where we are, and where we're going. Head over to you, Leslie. <laughs>
Thanks, Kevin. I can't share my screen yet until the other one comes down. Sorry, I think Chris is still sharing that if you. Okay, are you seeing that okay? Excellent, thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me. I feel like this, uh, my presentation won't be quite as technical as some of the others, but it, it actually, it ties quite a bit in what we're trying to achieve through America the Beautiful, which many of you know as, as 30 by 30, um, but 30 by 30 is only one component of America the Beautiful. And so just to make sure we're all on the same uh, page, wanted to, Give a little bit of background on the impetus for this initiative. Uh, President Biden issued Executive Order 14008 on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad in his first week of the president of his presidency. And within uh, one section of of that executive order, there was an entire set of directives related to conserving our nation's lands and waters. One part of that directed uh, multiple agencies, including the Department of Interior, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, in which NOAA sits, and the White House Council on Environmental Quality uh, to submit a report to the National Climate Task Force of um, recommending this goal on how we would achieve the goal of conserving at least 30% of US lands and waters by 2030. A key part of that directive was to ensure that we encourage uh, broad participation in um, executing that goal and developing the related the strategy um, and also coming up with a set of guidelines to determine what qualifies within this definition of conservation. And so the use of the term conservation was very intentional to ensure that we were thinking through uh, a continuum of approaches uh, from protection through sustainable use. Uh, but we not only needed to uh, come up with this set of this definition, but make sure that we were able to measure progress uh, toward the goal, including by submitting uh, submitting to the National Task Force, but also releasing publicly an annual progress report. And so before we uh, even developed the report responding to that directive, our agencies worked together to engage a broad range of stakeholders. Some of them you see just uh, generally described here in order to guide our, our work. And in May of last year, we released the Interagency Conserving and Restoring America the Beautiful Report, where we affirmed that there was a need to uh, pursue this conservation goal, but particularly to address three specific threats, uh, including the loss of nature, so natural, both natural areas and the biodiversity of wildlife, to tackle climate change, because again, uh, this conservation directive was part of uh, the, uh, President Biden's major climate um, executive order, and also to uh, in address inequitable access to the outdoors, recognizing that as a key component of the conservation work. Um, over the next 10 years, and we wanted to make sure it was locally led, though nationally scaled, and that we, again, consider a, con a continuum of approaches. So within the report, we described eight core principles to guide our implementation. You see those listed here, but in essence, it's uh, reiterating the need for it to be collaborative and inclusive, locally led, uh, benefiting all people. We wanted to make sure we can uh, we honor tribal sovereignty, but also consider private uh, property rights. Uh, because uh, economic development and job creation is a pillar of this administration, uh, we wanted to tie those conservation efforts to approaches that create jobs, but always using science as a guide and building on existing tools and strategy strategies. And I just want to um, note that these aren't in any hierarchical order. Uh, they are uh, equally considered depending on um, you know, each, each place uh, that we were uh, approaching for this, uh, this goal. So it's not that one is weighted more heavily than others. We were looking at all of these principles uh, collectively as we developed our strategies. 
recognizing that we can't do it all in one year and that it is a decades long initiative, the report also highlights six areas of early focus where our agencies were right away starting to take action uh, to address these key points that we thought would um, in the near term start to fulfill those eight principles. Um, but you see some of these uh, similar themes about working with tribes, local communities, um, and creating jobs there. But there's still uh, spe very specific recommendations uh, in order to make sure that we were tracking progress uh, and creating a baseline for what already exists. Uh, and so the report uh, had had a uh, recommendation for us to develop an American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas. Uh, our agencies are working on that right now, but once released, the atlas will provide a baseline of what's underway right now for conservation restoration. And then each of our agencies developed a conservation action plan so we can think about how to move the dial on those six focus areas uh, that I mentioned on the last slide. And then again, working together, releasing these annual progress reports to show how we're doing. Of course, all of these reports and actions require lots of interagency co coordination. So this is just a snapshot in some of the ways that we are uh, coordinating across our agencies. Uh, there's a principal level interagency working group uh, chaired by those, um, the, the CEQ chair and the secretaries of the three departments that were specifically called out in the executive order. Uh, and But it's grown. So those are the co-chairs, but many more uh, departments and agencies are now engaged in implementing America the Beautiful. And then we have multiple staff level subcommittees that report up to the working group, including one that NOAA co-chairs with USGS and USDA uh, on developing the Atlas, which has multiple work streams, including a, a marine work stream and, and several others. Uh, and then these other subcommittees on engagement and collaborative conservation, and a more um, a smaller steering committee that is working to link the policy and data decisions across these subcommittees so that we can um, bring decisions up to the principles. So first setting the baseline, um, which basically, as I noted, is the Atlas. Uh, we are working to develop this Atlas and had a public comment period that closed in March, asking specific questions about how do we capture this continuum of conservation. Uh, we, in addition to the official public, public comment period, we had public listening sessions and ongoing roundtables and conversations with a range of stakeholders, specifically targeting um, the Atlas and again, ongoing coordination across our agencies. You see here the key themes that we're trying to capture in the Atlas, again, using science and data and other knowledge, looking across the continuums, but most importantly, uh, making sure we're determining the best ways to uh, track the outcomes of the conservation work that is, conservation and restoration work that is underway or to come. Once the public comment period closed, uh, we had more than 35,000 comments representing more than 12,000 individual comments across those three things related to the um, related to those question themes that I, I talked about. Uh, and I think we'll share my slides after, but in case anyone's interested, uh, you can go and see some of those public comments and we're working through those now with our agencies. Uh, and again, looking to build an atlas that is accessible, can be, you know, we can tell the story, capture the data visually, and we expect to release the beta version by the end of this year. And then we'll have another round of input from stakeholders based on that beta version. But though we were setting that baseline, we knew that we had to continue to make progress. So I just wanna give a couple quick examples of ways that NOAA and the interagency have been working together to make progress. Again, these are just examples. It does not capture, because I'm at NOAA, I was able to easily bring some examples from my side, but um, all of the agencies have made some considerable progress in implementing America the Beautiful over the past year. We worked together to restore um, protections for Northeast Canes and Seamounts Marine National Monument off the Northeast. 
um, NOAA was charged specifically within the report to expand our National Marine Sanctuary System and our National Estuary Research Reserve System. Uh, and we've made progress over the year in establishing new sites and beginning the designation process for other sites, both in both systems. We have also worked very closely with the fishing community. We've worked with local partners to develop or to advance core work, so as in conservation core work and other examples. So again, these are just snapshots of the ways we've made some progress. But many of you, you know, want to know what's coming. Uh, again, NOAA specifically, we anticipate um, issuing a call for nominations to join a new federal advisory committee on marine and coastal area-based management. It would support NOAA's implementation of America the Beautiful as one component, but broadly across NOAA's authorities on area-based management. Uh, so expect to see that uh, later this spring. And again, other agencies have done something similar. And as I wrap up, I just wanna again, summarize the key milestones that we've seen over the past year um, since the executive order was released in January, um, ongoing public engagement. And again, by this December, we expect to release our second progress report and a beta version of the Atlas. And just a quick 45 second video to just show here. And then we tested it and see if it'll work for me. That's it for me. Great, thank you so much, Latisse. Uh, so while not as technically complex as the modeling, uh, it's still no less of a challenge, right? And so it's it's great to see this initiative moving forward. It's really good to see this administration uh, putting so much effort behind that. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, so moving on, we're gonna wrap up our panel with uh, Laura McKay from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. So. Laura McKay is a manager of the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. Uh, her work portfolio focuses on ocean planning, climate resilience, aquaculture, land acquisition, habitat restoration, and marine debris. Um, so Laura's going to talk to us today about us creating an ocean conservation work group. So take it away, Laura. Thank you, Kevin. Can you see my screen all right? Yep, that's great. Great. And I just want to thank you, Dr. Lafier, for that that um, exciting, inspirational video. Um, hopefully that gets everybody fired up to um, think about this next topic as we, as we wrap up. And I'll try to move along quickly because um, I do want to make sure we have the Q&A time. So um, uh, I'm going to talk today about should we make go create an ocean conservation work group? And um, presumably, um, Hopefully the answer will be yes, but I just want to real quickly go through a little bit of, of history here and just remind folks that when MARCO was formed, we had these four priorities for, <clears throat> for our ocean conservation agreement amongst the five governors. And of course, coordinating protection of marine habitats was one of those um, key goals. And then some of you recall back in 2016, when we had a regional planning body we did actually complete a, a Mid-Atlantic Ocean Action Plan, and it was really in two parts. One was to promote ocean ecosystem health, and the other was to provide for um, existing and emerging ocean uses in a sustainable manner. 
So under that um, healthy ocean ecosystem goal, we had six actions. So I just was gonna run through where we are today on some of those things. One of the first things was identify and assess ecologically rich areas. That has somewhat stalled. Um, we did run into some, some issues and concerns about mapping ecologically rich areas, but I'll talk about that some more in a minute. Um, mapping shifts in species due to climate change. I think you've seen from previous presentations, a lot of that's well underway and uh, more coming. So I think we're making good progress there. Developing a mid-Atlantic um, mid Ocean Acidification Monitoring Network. We now have MACAN underway and they are moving right along with developing research and figuring out where we're gonna need ocean acidification monitors um, moving forward. Uh, fourth was developing a regionally appropriate marine debris strategy. We have done that and we have a marine debris work group under MACO. And um, we've done a lot of work there over on the right here. Um, this is one of the posters that we've created thanks to a grant that uh, Marco received from NOAA the marine debris program, um, trying to get people to not release balloons and um, provide um, alternatives. So we have a campaign that just launched this spring um, on that issue. Uh, fifth was to develop and publish indicators of ocean health. And again, um, that effort has kind of stalled, something to think about. Some other areas of the country do have some ocean health indicators and, and uh, monitoring what's happening there. And then the sixth thing was incorporating traditional knowledge of ocean health in ocean planning. I have a question mark, are we underway on that? We're trying, we are um, certainly um, trying to do more tribal engagement and I think um, more will be coming on that. So going back to that first um, action that was somewhat controversial, just to explain what we were trying to do there, we were looking at defining components of ecologically rich areas. Um, high productivity, um, high biodiversity, great abundance, vulnerability, and rarity. And then also think in terms of how those areas look on a map. Some of them are fixed areas that stay in place over time. Um, others are clusters of areas. Some of them are ephemeral. They come and go seasonally or, or um, over decades. And then there are those that are dynamic or ambulatory. They just keep moving around. And then we were going to define specific thresholds for meeting those components and develop um, a map of these ecologically rich areas and create fact sheets about them just as an educational effort. Um, and those mapped areas were gonna have fuzzy boundaries. Um, they weren't meant to be regulatory boundaries at all. Um, and then the fourth step was gonna be to identify criteria for choosing a pilot area and then choose a pilot area and then do an assessment to look at how we manage that important area um, and look, for, look at things like health trends and overlay human uses and how we are managing the area so that we could think about whether our current management practices are sufficient to maintain that area. And then we were gonna publish an assessment report on that particular area and just move down our list. So that's, that's what the plan had been and just something to think about moving forward. Other things were going on in the um, Mid-Atlantic Ocean Action Plan. We were identifying and prioritizing um, science and research needs, and there's a lot underway now um, between um, uh, the Marco and NROC co-leading the new Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, and of course, ROSA, the Regional Ocean Science Alliance. So we've made some good headway there. Um, implementing best practices to enhance coordination and use of the portal. Um, I lead our ocean mapping and data team um, with uh, Carl's great help, um, who you heard previously talk about the portal. So tremendous progress um, on the portal and that will continue to be updated as long as the funds keep flowing to us. Um, evaluating management options under the Coastal Zone Management Act. I don't think we've done too much there lately or on um, ocean action plan performance and uh, monitoring evaluation. As you know, the um, regional planning bodies were dismantled um, back in 2017. And so MACO is our way of, of pulling back to the table, um, the federal agencies, the Fishery Management Council and the federally recognized tribes. So on this slide, just listed here, um, MACO's general goals and on the right, what our current MARCO and MACO work groups are. So as I mentioned, we have an ocean mapping data team 
We have the marine debris team, we have MACAN, we have a non-consumption recreation work group, and we have an offshore wind regional collaborative. But what we don't have is an ocean conservation work group. Um, but some other activities that have been going on since 2017, um, as Carl was showing you some of the um, sliders on how, how fish species, the core abundance has changed over time since the 1970s, decade by decade. Um, we've had lots and lots of marine life updates um, since 2017. And again, the Regional Ocean Science Alliance also looking at what our, what our scientific needs are. Um, and as, as Marta mentioned, um, TNC developed this wind sighting tool that takes the marine life data from the portal and pulls it together so that you can draw a polygon on a map and get back information about the relative abundance of um, species in that particular area. So a way of trying to synthesize some of the marine life data and make it more useful. Um, Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, again, they're working away now um, with various subcommittees to figure out what else do we need to know um, in order to better manage our species and habitats. And as um, Dr. Latisse Lafayre just mentioned, we have this whole 30-30 goal in the background now too, or I shouldn't say the background, the forefront. So what can we as MAKO um, do to help support um, these efforts? So that leads us to this question, should we form a MAKO Ocean Conservation Work Group? And if so, what are the outcomes we'd wanna see from such a work group? And what products or tools could we develop that would help support marine conservation and a healthy ocean ecosystem? Um, what would a successful work group collaboration look like? And how could we use an ocean conservation work group to strengthen our partnerships and connections with each other? And finally, what could an ocean conservation work group do to advance our conservation priorities with our partners? So these are the questions that we want to ask you in our next session when we have breakout groups. Um, I believe that was my last slide, yep. Um, so with that, Kevin, hopefully I caught us up on some time a little bit and um, we can uh, start the charge for the breakout. Well, I think we're gonna have Q&A now, right? Correct. Um, Thank you so, so much, Laura. Yeah, I think. We'll, and maybe we can extend the Q and A just a little bit longer. A little bit, if we, we and that's a good reminder to for folks uh, add questions to the chat as well, because uh, so far there's not a lot of questions in there. Um, but I'm sure we can talk about a lot of uh, interconnections from all these um, things that we just heard about. So. Uh, but thank you, Laura, uh, for, for standing that up. I guess, you know, it's we're a bit of ringers here for should we form a group? Uh, <laughs> we've kind of been having this conversation on, in the background a little bit, but that's, you know, where we're now we get to include all of our, our partners here through the forum. So that's great. Um, so I'll just ask all of our presenters to come back on camera if, if they'd like, if they're still here. So we have some questions um, and we'll, we'll go through and see what we can chat about. Um, so far, I know I see one question in there it's for Dr. LaFear. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, California recently released its Pathway to 30 by 30 report. In addition to national and federal agency goals, what advice do you have for states in the mid-Atlantic, MAKO, to develop and advance marine protection and conservation objectives? Um, thanks for that question. Yes, very aware of the California goals and their release, we've been working with them closely across, uh, with, with, within NOAA as well as across the interagencies, recognizing um, they've been a leader on this and taking different approaches. I think um, there's a suite of advice, but I, I think some specific ideas I have for states in particular is that you can work much more closely with community-based organizations than the federal government can, often we need liaisons. Um, so states have a much better position to work directly with communities. I also encourage uh, state agencies to work with, as appropriate, philanthropy, uh, work with those organizations within their community, within their states, because often philanthropic organizations can provide uh, sort of a bridge. They can support uh, technical assistance and capacity uh, where um, communities might not be able to advance conservation efforts on their own, but working with the states and local governments with this, some bridge funding and support from philanthropy can help advance those very specific goals. So those are just a couple uh, ideas uh, for states. 
thank you. I think that's that's really helpful um, to kind of make sure we're focusing on that community engagement and how we can do that. I know it's it's a thing that we all try to think about and how we can do that better. So I think that's really helpful. And I would just um, say very, very quickly, if you have areas that are already conserved in your states, think about their opportunities to strengthen the work there um, as well as creating new ones. So there are opportunities to create, to strengthen uh, existing conservation efforts in states. And I think that's an opportunity for all of us to continue to highlight those as well. Um, some of them are, are fairly protected, but maybe a lot of folks don't know about them. And so this is another opportunity for us to collaborate together on, on how we manage those protections. So. Um, so is there, I don't see any other questions in there. Um, you know, I guess you can probably open that to, to the rest of the panel too, if, if you have any ideas on, you know, this, some of the questions that we're posing to the entire group as we move into that uh, panel from your perspective of what you just talked about, um, you know, what are some of the things we should be uh, addressing through this kind of group? Um, where can this regional effort help leverage what you need? I'll give it a try, Kevin. Um, one thing that um, has crossed my mind because there was so much concern about whether you call it ecologically rich areas or ecologically important areas and marine sanctuaries, there's you know a lot of fear that that means exclusion and you know that you can't do anything else in those areas. And I've been wondering if we might be more politically successful if we talked more about having um, fisheries and recreation conservation areas that, um, you know, we set aside areas very clearly with hard boundaries for shipping lanes and wind leases, um, but we really don't put any boundaries around where are the important fishing areas? Are we protecting those? Um, we do with management, of course. Um, and for recreation, it's not like we set aside areas and say this is, you know, for recreation. But if we combined fisheries and recreation interests, which can be quite compatible, um, and then try to, to talk about um, conserving some of those areas, I wonder if that would be, um, you know, a more politically palatable approach to conservation. Thank you, Laura. And I, you know, coming from a perspective of a, a CZM manager, I'm sure you're from Virginia's perspective, uh, kind of like New Jersey, where you end up looking at, we do have certain protections through the CZM programs for, for recreation and other things, but then how do we leverage that into a broader context of ocean management and other things too? So I think there's, there's definitely opportunities to, to advance that kind of work. Uh, let's see. Seeing any other questions in there? Um, so, I guess you know I'll, I'll ask Chris. Uh, you know, from from the level of complexity in the modeling uh, that you're looking at for that fisheries habitat and those things, um, I think I was kind of strikes me as, in, and also thinking about Marta's uh, discussion earlier about you know looking at things in the future, how well can we integrate kind of that future casting into those habitat modeling. Um, and and if, if it can't be done now, what exactly do we need to integrate in those in that process? And is there data gaps that we can fill or work to fill? Hey, sorry. Um, yeah, there's, so, we're in a place now in terms of, of, you know, we have a great, very long-term historical data set, at least on the, on the shelf. So there's, there's biological data in terms of the animals that we're trying to understand. Um, and there's increasingly, you know, the, the technology and the, mod the modeling frameworks are growing. They're, they're capable now at this point of, of kind of doing that kind of work. One of the limitations is the, you know, how good the climate models are. Um, so there's only, you know, there are lots of variables that we find that drive, drive fish distributions, everything from chlorophyll to the water optical parameters to, you know, 
And so the climate models right now are very temperature focused quite reasonably because that is the primary driver of all these things. But if we also want to understand how the you know how that will interact with the other factors that all that that, that are also important in driving distributions, um, I think some of one of the limitations we're facing now is there's just not great data on on how some of those other things will change. Um, like we know there's going to be more precipitation and that's going to push more more runoff and and you know freshwater land terrestrial nutrients and terrestrial uh, you know sediments into the water that's going to affect optics, um, things, you know, all they're all a whole range of things that we just don't have great estimates for for the future. So right now we're kind of limited to thinking about things that can be can be, you know, mostly physical parameters like temperature and um, oxygen uh, that can be modeled reasonably well. Um, but you know, as those models, those models are also continuing to evolve, and they're they're continuing to add parameters. They now have biogeochemical models that include things like nutrients and and primary production and secondary, even some plankton, um, zooplankton kind of uh, categories. So there's as those as the forcing gets better, we'll be able to. To, to produce better models, I think. But on the other hand, there's also, you know, the better the biological sampling is, like we models can only figure out so much. And the, the more we can, the more fish data we get as well, the better. Um, and the more we can collaborate with places like uh, Maracus and Niracus to, to, to find ways to uh, improve the, the covariate data sets that we're working with too, even even not necessarily in the future, but just in the present day, um, those those things will all play a role in and helping us to figure out what's going to happen with with less uncertainty, hopefully. Yes, thank you. There's always going to be a level of that uncertainty, right? And we have to just be able to make sure we adapt as we as we manage all these various things. So, uh, I see one more question. Popped in here. I think it's for you, Laura. Um, it's in your slides. Steps for action number one, uh, numbers four and five. What is meant by pilot? Uh, I'm asking in the context of the robust discussion today about the need for conservation, juxtaposed with the current industrial proposals for offshore wind from uh, Massachusetts to North Carolina, uh, and lack of information about offshore resources. There seems to be a disconnect there. In the slide regarding pilot, how does that relate to the offshore wind proposals? They okay, I'll see if I, if I understand <laughs> Carrie's question, but um, I just pulled that slide up again. So what I was talking about here was um, if we went through this stepwise process to try to map ecologically rich areas, <clears throat> once we had done that, we would choose one of those ecologically rich areas and try to do this assessment report in terms of the current health of that area, how we manage it. Um, so it would be, we would choose, we would not choose um, an area that has a wind lease on it. Um, we would be choosing an area that um, is, it was currently, you know, an area of high productivity or um, biodiversity, abundance, vulnerability, or rarity. Um, I suppose you could choose an area of a wind lease and, and do an assessment on it. But the idea originally, um, and again, this is back in 2016 or so, <laughs> lots happened since then. Um, but the idea had been to figure out how we can understand where the best remaining places are, where are those, um, I think as Sylvia Earle called them, blue spots um, in the ocean that are, that are really important to protect and conserve. So it was a way of identifying those and figuring out whether we are actually um, doing a good job of protecting and conserving them. Does that answer your question, Carrie? If Carrie could come off mute. <laughs> I don't see a response, but I hope so because we're we're running we're running out of time <laughs> <laughs> so i think we're gonna have to end it there on the questions um i just want to take this opportunity again to thank uh the so mic wasn't working but yes thank you great um <laughs>
So I just want to take an opportunity to thank you guys all again. Uh, I think it was great hearing from you, uh, getting this opportunity to chat and have some quest questions answered. Um, so I'll just to remind you all, if, if your schedules allow, it would be wonderful if you could stay with us uh, for the breakout sessions coming up after our break. Um, clearly, your knowledge and expertise is, is incredibly valuable to, you know, as we talk through conservation in, in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, and again, I just want to thank everyone um, for joining us in this portion of the, the Sustainable Ocean Ecosystem session. Uh, we're going to take a little break and come back. We had at 2.30, but it is 2.30, so <laughs> we'll give people at least five minutes, so maybe come back at 2.35. Uh, once we come back in, we'll divide up everyone into breakout sessions where we can discuss those questions that Laura had uh, raised before. Um, I know there's still some more uh, questions that just popped in the chat. We'll make sure we capture those and, and we can address them um, if we can um, in the future. So, and we'll bring them over to the breakout sessions as well. So thanks everyone. Um, we'll see you in a few minutes.